Amen. 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 I'm going to go ahead and read the scripture because some of y'all have been standing for a few minutes and you're already looking weary. But I do want to thank Ramona for being with us today and helping us out today. Amen. We got in a little bit of a pinch and she just come right on there and just did it right off the top of her head. Amen. And I got to do a little singing today. So I'm, so I'm, I'm excited about that. Yeah, I, know, I know you're excited about that. And also, uh, this week, uh, uh, Joey and his wife will be heading down to take our offering down to the Dream Center. And so next Sunday, hope, uh, next or the Sunday after that, maybe, uh, we're going to have a slideshow so you can kind of see what we've, uh, what we've given to and what, we've, uh, and what we did with that ballot money. Amen. Ms. Gloria says, okay, that's enough, Pastor. I've got to sit down. Let me read my passage this morning. Black, blacksmiths and forgers. In 1 Samuel chapter 13, 1 Samuel chapter 13, the Bible reads this way, beginning in verse 16. And Saul, Jonathan his son, and the people present with them remained in Gibeah of Benjamin, but the Philistines encamped in Michmash. Then raiders came out of the camp of the Philistines in three companies. One company turned onto the road of Oprah in the land of Shual. Another company turned to the road of Beth Haran. And another company turned to the road of the border that overlooked the valley of Zeboom toward the wilderness. Now, there was no blacksmith to be found throughout all the land of Israel. For the sake, for, for the Philistines said, lest the Hebrews make swords and spears. But all the Israelites would go down to the Philistines to sharpen each man's plowshare, his mattock, his axe, or his sickle. This is what they used for their weapons. And the charge for sharpening a was a pim for the plowshares, the mattocks, the fork, and the axes, and to set point of the goat. So it came about on the day of battle that there was neither a sword nor spear found in the hand of the people who were with Saul and Jonathan. This morning I want to talk about blacksmith. And for Father, I thank you for the reading of this word, and I ask that this word pierce every heart. That Father, that those that need to hear this word today will hear this word. I come against every force of darkness, every enemy, in the name of Jesus, that would distract and cause this word not to be heard today. That, Father, that those be stripped away even this very moment in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that this, this word will be heard no matter where individuals are at, Father, that they'll hear it whether online, whether here, or whether in replay, or whether on YouTube. I don't care. They just need to hear this word. So I rebuke every demonic force that would keep it from being heard and understood. And we speak it forth now in the name of Jesus. And everybody says, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you for standing with me that long. As we enter into this passage, we find that the Israelites are being attacked from every side. How many's ever felt like you were being attacked from every side? My, I'm the only one who got two or three people. How many's ever felt like you're being attacked from every side? Yeah. And not only are they being attacked from every side, they are found at this point without any weapon to fight. Can I tell you this morning that's a bad place to be in? It's a terrible place to be in a war with nothing to fight with. As we look at this passage right here, we find that Saul has just been 
anointed king and he sets up his authority and he sets up his rule. I want you to understand also that Saul is not the chosen king of the Israelites. Saul is the chose, uh, chosen king of the Israelite, Israelites by God's or ordination, but he is the chosen king of the Israelites by the, by the Israelites' ordination. They felt that they needed a king. So they went and found the tallest, the strongest, and the best looking guy they could and said, he looks like a king. Can I tell you this morning, just because somebody looks like they're a king doesn't mean they're qualified to be a king. Somebody missed me right there. Just because they look good on camera and they got pretty teeth and they're wearing fashionable clothes doesn't make them a preacher or a minister or anointed. It doesn't make them called of God. Sometimes we appoint our own leader because we don't wait for God's leaders. Well, we're getting good just right off the, right off the get-go, aren't we? Amen. So I want you to understand what's, that, so understand what's going on. So this is what's taking place. So Saul comes in, he sets up his kingdom, and the first thing he does is he goes and tries to make a name for himself. He did not have to do this. He chose to do this. And he goes into the Philistine camp, and uh, into a Philistine's camp that he was pretty sure that he could take, and he takes the camp and destroys the Philistines, and he stirs up the devil. Now, there's nothing wrong with stirring up the devil. Sometimes we need to stir up the devil and get the devil out of our life. Amen? But sometimes the devil ain't even messing with us, and we just need to leave him alone. I lost you. Sometimes, so, so, sometimes we just got to, the devil's not even bothering us, he's not even messing with us, but we're going out and we're messing with him. And wondering why he's got stirred up against us. Because we're out messing with him. Amen. My day used to, my, my day, my day used to say, listen, I don't have to go look, I don't have to go looking for devils. I don't have to go look. When the devil wants to find me, it's going to find me. <laughs> he said, I got better things to do than go looking for a devil. Somebody say amen. He says, so I'm going to go look for the things of God. But what Saul does is he goes and he's trying to prove a point. He's trying to prove he's worthy to be king because in his heart and his spirit, he already knew that God hadn't appointed him, the people had, so he's trying to prove something. Does that make sense? So he goes and he tries to prove something and the enemy comes back and retaliates. And the enemy comes back and retaliates and this is what happens. This is what happens. The enemy comes in. This is what the pastor says. It says, there weren't any blacksmiths in the land of Israel. And the Israelites were dependent on the Philistines to sharpen their tools and to sharpen their weapons. Can I tell you, you're in a bad place if your spiritual tools that, you have, that you're using for warfare, you have to depend on the world and the devil and the enemy to sharpen your spiritual warfare tools because you've, because you've allowed the enemy to come into your life and to steal away your resources? And this is where they're at. All their weapons were either in the hands of the enemy or, or, or in the hands of the enemy or their weapons weren't weren't usable for the battle. So it tells us that what the, what the physicists did, they came in and they took all the blacksmiths and they took all the forgers, anyone in that land that could, that could forge a weapon or that could sharpen a weapon or could make tools of warfare that could be used against them, they came in and they kidnapped, they captured those people and they took them out of, the, out of Israel and held them captive so that Israel find themselves in a place that they couldn't, they couldn't sharpen their hoes, they couldn't sharpen their plows, they couldn't sharpen their swords, they couldn't sharpen their goads, they couldn't sharpen their fort, they couldn't sharpen anything. So that means they couldn't till the land, they couldn't do anything they needed to do, and they couldn't go to war. So they couldn't produce a, they couldn't produce a product, and they couldn't go to war, they couldn't protect themselves, and they couldn't even produce a blessing for themselves because the, the enemy, they had opened their door and the enemy had come in and removed their ability to be able to do that. They had the resources, but not the ability to use the resources. And I think that's where we find ourselves in the church and in our personal lives today. 
so many times. We have the resources. We have the Holy Spirit. We have God in our life. We have a love for our Heavenly Father. And some more times than not, we're doing the things that we need to be doing. But we allow open doors in our life. And we allow things in our life. And the enemy comes in and he realizes with God on our side, they don't, he doesn't stand a chance in our situation. So he comes in and removes the things in our life that gives us the ability to use the resources that God has already supplied for us I'm giving you a good word this morning if you'll take it in he's already given the resources so the enemy comes in and he uses your depression and he uses your insecurity and he uses your anxiety and he uses your family and he uses your job and he uses all these things and he comes in and he steals away the things in your life that that gives you the ability to use your resources God will never leave you. He's with you always. The resources of the Heavenly Father rest inside of you right now. Whether you feel it or not. Whether you feel empty or not. The resources of heaven are in you right now because God is in you. The Holy Spirit is in you. You accepted Christ as your personal Savior and He is deep inside of you and the resources are there. But what you can't do, you can't use the resources if you don't have faith. You can't use the resources if you don't have joy. You can't use the resources if you don't have peace. You can't use the resources if you allow the enemy to come in and steal your joy. Take your peace and, 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 and come in and take those things out of your life. And when he does it, gives you, it takes your ability to use them. This is what's taking place. That's why the Word of God tells us that the joy of the Lord is our. Because it gives us the ability. So the enemy didn't just come in and destroy. The enemy was smart. The enemy came in and took the ability away to use the resources that they already had. So Israel comes to fight and they meet at Michmash and the people go into confusion because Saul once again takes matters into his own hand and doesn't wait for the prophet Samuel to come and seek the Lord and find out what needs to be done. So, so Saul comes in and offers a profane sacrifice to the Heavenly Father because it was not his place to do that. It was the prophet's place to do that. And he, and he did it. He did it anyway. And the people went into confusion. Instead of coming together, they went into confusion. And the, and the whole army began to scatter. And we find Saul sitting right here after making a profane sacrifice to the Lord uh, uh, trying to get the mind of God, which he should have got the mind of God a long time before he went to war. Somebody say amen. And he's sitting there now. He's down to just a few hundred men. Sitting in a cave. And if you'll read over to chapter 14, which I won't go into today, but it gives us a, an account of what was there. And there's so many horsemen and so, and so many chairs and so many men and foot soldiers that it looks like the sands of the seashore and you can look over them and as far as you can see the enemy and they come out and the enemy a mass pulled everything the enemy had together to come against Saul and they knew they didn't have a sword they knew they didn't have anything to fight with they knew that the weapons were gone because they took the weapons isn't that like the devil he comes in he steals your joy he steals your peace He, he, begins, he begins to take all this stuff out of your life. God's still there. The resources are still there. And then, he really, and when He gets you to the point that you don't have the ability to use what God already has given you, then He just doesn't go get a couple of devils. He goes and gets the, he goes get the whole legion of hell, it seems like sometimes. Somebody say Amen. And you wake up and you look out and all of a sudden, as far as you can see, there is no hope. In fact, he said, the enemy was, even though they knew they didn't have any weapons, the enemy said, you know what, we're not just going to do a head-on attack. We're going to come from three different stations. So the enemy just didn't come meet them head-on. The enemy actually did everything they could to surround him. Don't know about you, but I've had the times in my life where I felt surrounded. The Philistines knew that if they could take what the Israelites had and keep them, keep them from shaping it into something they could fight with, 
that the battle was already won. Don't you listen to me. This is a good word this morning. There's people that need to be listening to this word. When you have to depend on the world to sharpen your spiritual weapons, I mentioned this before. When you must depend on the world to sharpen your spiritual weapons, then you are being set up for defeat. You will not win that battle. My dad used to say it this way. He says, if days of your life is what guides your life, you are already in trouble before you get started. Some of you don't know about soap operas and stuff, but these other folks, they understand what soap operas are. Now all television is soap operas, so it don't matter. It, it, they all follow the same scheme these days. How many of you miss the times you can watch a show, it starts in 30 minutes, and it starts and it ends, and they finish the thought. They, they finish the show, and then the next show is a whole different show, but it's about the same thing. And, but nowadays, they just carry it on, carry it on. Give, every, every week's a cliffhanger, amen? Every, week, every week's a cliffhanger. You know what that's all? That's a soap opera. It's a soap opera. But if you're allowing the world to sharpen your weapon, if you're allowing social media, TikTok and, and Facebook and Instagram to, 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 to shape your perspective and to shape your faith and to shape, and to shape the things around you and to sharpen your life, I'm going to tell you right now, you are already defeated. I'm going to make a bold statement. TikTok is not going to win your spiritual warfare. Come on. Instagram is not going to defeat the enemy in your life. Yet you spend more time on TikTok, Instagram, and I'm talking to probably the younger group here now. <laughs> no, no, that's not so, so true. But, uh, but we spend more time on Facebook, TikTok, and Instagram than we do the Word of God and we wonder why our tools and our weapons for warfare aren't sharp enough and we're not ready for the war and we're not ready for the attack is because we spent more time in the world than we have with God and the world is sharpening our tools and the world is the one taking care of our weapons and the world is the one taking care of the stuff that produces harvest in our life and we're wondering why it doesn't work. It's because you're using the wrong things to sharpen your tools. We need blacksmiths in the church. We we need forgers in the church. We need men and women of God that will become men and women of God and begin to lead men and women and people into the house of God and bring them to the house of God and sharpen their skills and sharpen their spiritual weapons and give them something to stand on. We need blacksmiths and we need forgers in the house of God. And if TikTok and all that stuff is all you got going on, you're already set up for defeat. You do know everything you're looking on there is not real, right? Right? Can I just call it like it is? Is everybody all right? Is everybody awake? Yeah. I'm on a rabbit trail, so just hold on a second. I got to chase this rabbit. <laughs> the rate I'm going, it might be the only dinner I get. We pull up all this stuff on our Facebook and our Instagram and everything. And you young ladies, I'm going to tell you right now. Shame on you. Shame on you. I have to go through my stuff and delete stuff all the time because these little girls are trying to do these little dance and you have to get deleted all the time trying to, keep it, trying, to keep it, trying to keep stuff off your phone. And, 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 and you post these pictures of yourself. And you put them through all these filters so that you can present to the world something that you're not. Can I tell you, I'm going to make some of you mad, but don't you listen to me. The reason you have to use all the 
filters and stuff to put your pictures on the Facebook and, and your Instagram and all this stuff, and you do all this stuff on that, it's because you don't like who you are and you don't like the way God made you. You don't like anything about you. So you have to present something else to the world and you go into a fantasy world and you begin to look at that fantasy world and wish that's who you were and that was where you're at and you'll never be that and you'll never be there in that place because that's not what God created you to be. And then, then the devil sells you a lie. And then you become unhappy with yourself. You become unhappy with your spouse. You become unhappy with your family because you're living in a fantasy world on something that doesn't even exist. And you're looking at everybody else's picture. Can I tell you right now, I went to a funeral the other day and I looked at the people that were in there. I hadn't seen them in a long time. And all these ladies come up and said, Hey, Pastor Allen, I hadn't seen you in a long time. And I was looking and I have seen them on Facebook and I have seen them on, on Instagram. I don't have TikTok. I, I just rebuke that in the name of Jesus and I don't, I don't even have that one but I got Instagram and Facebook and, and I looked on there and I couldn't even recognize who they were because they doctored the picture so much I looked down and said my God they've aged 30 years in a day come on somebody say amen <laughs> I better get to my lesson I stopped preaching and started meddling Pray, St. Pastor. Lamb. This is how we allow the world. If we're allowed, oh, now no, I remember how I got there. Now, when we allow the world to sharpen our weapon, when we allow Facebook and Instagram and all these social outlets to give us our peace and our joy, you have already lost the battle because you're going to the wrong place. You're going to the wrong place. So the Philistines come in, they take all the blacksmiths and they take all the forgers in the land and remove Israel's ability to prepare and create new weapons for warfare. And they come up to them, like I said, with, and with, when they remove their full ability to fight and they come up and they come at them with full force. And as I begin to look at this, war is about to take place. It's not maybe going to happen. It's about to happen. And Israel is in a place where the very enemy that was coming against them had them already subjected to their rule to sharpen the, even the very tools that produce the harvest in their life. And I ask myself, how do you get to that point? How do you get to the point that you meet the devil head on and you don't have any weapon? What idiot would take his people to war and knowing that they didn't have any weapons? What kind of fool does it take? The answer is this. Saul took his army. That's the most foolish thing he ever done. Well, not the most foolish thing, one of them. He started off being foolish. And he takes his whole army into battle without a weapon. Now what kind of fool does that? Don't say fool. I didn't say rocker. I said fool. That's a whole other mess. You remember that message, don't you? <laughs> Why can't... Well, I can't say idiot either. We've got young kids in the room. Oh, I just said it. <laughs> what kind of person takes the full force of his army into battle without a weapon? I'll tell you what kind of person does that. A person that doesn't know what's going on in his own house. A person that's so entrenched and involved in themselves that they don't know what's going on in their own house. I told you I was going to get real with you today. So when I look at this passage, the first thing I see, the reason they would enter in 
to battle with no weapons is because there was a lack of godly leadership. There's a lack of godly leadership. In fact, in verse 12, it says this. I don't have the verse 12 up there, but in verse 12 it says this. The Philistines will now come down on me at Gilgal. And this is what Saul has said. He realizes they're about to come upon him. He realizes he's made a mistake. And he says, and I have not made such supplication to the Lord. Don't you think that before he went into battle, before he took all his people in, that maybe he should have inquired of God? Don't you think that in your family, in your relationships, the things that are going around you, before you jump in and start spitting and spouting and doing all your stuff, that maybe you should inquire of the Lord? We get in our situations and we go, I don't understand, I don't understand. It's because sometimes we walk into battle without any weapon. Because we didn't inquire of the Lord. How in the world could Saul not realize that the Philistines had come in and captured all the blacksmiths and all the forges? How could he not understand that he had an army of people following him that he had that didn't have one sword or a plowshare or anything among the whole bunch of them? How could it? You see, a good king, when he's going into war, a good king comes out and he walks around the ranks. He walks through the ranks and he begins to build them up and cheer them on and get them psyched up to go into, go into the battle they're about to go into. But Saul evidently wasn't doing that. He's out in the cave feeling sorry for himself, sitting over there in a cave, sitting over that cave where they're thinking only about himself. He had never even expected the army. He had never went out. He hadn't listened to what the generals were saying. He hadn't listened to what anybody else was saying. All he could think about was his self and his agenda and what he was doing. And he didn't really care at that point what was going to happen to anybody else or what's going to happen to the nation. All Saul was cared about, cared about was Saul. I can make some real, real nowadays application right there if I wanted to. <laughs> All he cared about, and, and, and he had no idea what was going on within his army. And because of his lack of godly leadership, they find them at a place where they're facing an enemy that cannot be overcome. Without any weapons. In fact, the Bible says, the only weapon they had was a sword. One sword. And it was Saul. Pastor Allen, I don't do that. Can I tell you something? We, we actually do the same thing. We become so distracted with life. Trying to make enough money to pay our bills trying to raise our kids, just trying to deal with everyday life. That we leave out the very thing that gives us strength and authority in our lives. And that is our close relationship with Christ. When you're right with God and you've got your eyes fixed on Jesus, you can walk through hell and have peace. I don't buy the argument, I can't have peace and I can't have joy because of this or this or that. When you have Christ and you've got your eyes on Christ, you may be having trouble and you may be having a hard time, but I'm telling you, if you keep your eyes on Christ and you have a close relationship with Christ and you don't sacrifice that, you can walk through the very gates and corridors of hell with peace and joy. This is how the enemy steals our ability to sharpen and forge our spiritual weapon. And causes us not to even have the ability to fight. I want you to listen to this. The things that God has given us grace over. 
How many has ever asked God's grace over your life? Over your past? The very things that God has given us grace over, the enemy drags up out of the grave and lays it at our feet. And we look at what we were. And we're looking at that old decayed carcass of a dead man or a dead woman that's already been covered by grace. God didn't drag that back up. The Holy Spirit didn't drag that back up. The enemy of your life drug that back up. And you look at it and you buy back in to the same thing that you already had grace over. And you buy, buy, you buy back in to the, the, the brokenness that you once were and the fear that you once had. And, and, you, and you become afraid that everybody around you is going to see what's actually going on inside of you. And you're afraid that everybody's going to see that your weakness, your weakness, they're going to see what's actually going on. The very things that you're trying to hide, and you're trying to hide so well. I'm telling you what's going on. You're buying into a lie. You're buying into a situation. God has great things for you. God wants you to win the battle, but you're allowing the enemy to come in and to steal your peace and to steal your joy and take your ability away to fight the war. God is still there. You may feel empty on side, inside. You may feel dead in your spirit. You may think everything in your life around you is going down the drain and going to hell in a handbasket. But I'm telling you right now, the presence of God is still in you. It is still there. But you've just allowed the enemy to remove your ability to use the resources that God has already given you. This needs to be a book. Amen. Start Fred, write it for me. Amen. I'll sign my name on it. <laughs> Amen. Where am I? Those things that we put to death with grace are now being pulled out of the grave to remind us that we're not worthy. How many know this is a real message? How many are with me? You get so focused, you get so focused in on fixing you that you miss the enemy removing the things in your life that you need. To prepare for war. So Israel had a lack of leadership. The second thing I see here. Israel was in need of blacksmiths and forgers, which I took my title from at right there. Israel was needed blacksmiths and forgers. Our churches today are full of people who come to church to be blessed and to get fed. And I'm all right with that. But can I tell you what the church needs right now? I don't need a bunch of sheep that just want to come into the pastor of the church house to graze on Sunday morning. I understand some of us are at a point in our life. And I, understand, I, I understand, but I want you to listen to me. We need as a church, not just this church, I'm talking about every church, we need spiritual blacksmiths and spiritual forgers that are willing to do what it takes to sharpen and prepare this next generation for spiritual warfare. That's a good word. Come on, everybody's listening. I think you just patty cake. You either clap your hands or don't clap your hands. Either say amen or don't say amen. Do something. Maybe Miss Harding will get up and start dancing. Pat Sam, what do you mean? Can I? I'm just getting more trouble. The church has traded blacksmiths and forgers for organizers and CEOs. <laughs> well, there went my free breakfast and lunch. I was going to get from other pastors this week. I'm going to have to pay for it myself now. 
that coming? <laughs> Thank God I can. Our churches are full of those who know the ways of God. An older generation, I'm speaking to you, and when I say older generation, I'm talking about our 40 year olds and up. Our church, <laughs> way up. Amen. This glory says, ah, 40. This glory's going, I wish I'd see 40 again. <laughs> Our churches are full of those who know the ways of God. I want you to listen to this. But are content to sit in the pew and watch the next generation just fall off a cliff into hell. Oh, I've already done my bit. I've already done what I'm supposed to do. You ain't done till you took your last breath. We've got a generation, we've got a whole slew of kids and, 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 and teenagers here, and that's only half of what we we, we got that, 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 that come in. And they, they need godly examples, and they need blacksmiths, and they need forgers. If we're going to just sit and wait for them one day to come to some realization that they need God, and all of a sudden they're just going to magically get filled with the Holy Spirit and magically begin to serve God and magically begin to do all these things, I'm going to tell you right now, we're going to be waiting until hell freezes over. We need blacksmiths and we need forgers in the house of God. I need less CEOs and less organizers and less people who just want a title across their cross their name so they can say I'm this or I'm that I need people that will sharpen the swords of this next generation sharpen the swords of our kids sharpen the swords of our teenagers begin to raise up a church I don't, I don't mean to make you upset I don't mean to disturb you I don't want you to get all freaked out and walk out of here depressed but I'm, I'm almost 60 years old and some of you are older than that and, and, and whether, whether we realize it or not, our days on this earth are numbered and we don't know how long we got left. I pray the Lord comes quickly and we all go right now. But if not, we'll go by the grave at some point because we've already buried, I'm burying somebody today and I'm burying somebody again on Tuesday. I mean, come on, we, this, is the way, this is the way life is and we need to begin to realize if we don't stand up right now and begin to train and become blacksmiths, and forgers of the kingdom of God and train up this next generation, my friend, there's not going to be a generation that knows God. There's not going to be a generation that knows the power of God. There's not going to be a generation that understands what we understand. We have to do it, and we got to do it now. We need to be blacksmiths, and we need to be forgers. Teachers and leaders, ready to sharpen the weapons of a new generation. The generation that we have now, my generation, your generation, doing everything we can to keep our head above water and just keep on moving forward and keep, keep our eyes straight on God. Amen? Because there's so much going on in the world. But we have grounding we have we we've been grounding the word in a completely different way than this new generation has. If you think it's rough for us right now and trying to keep our eyes focused, can you imagine what it is for our kids? We need blacksmiths. We need forgers. It's time for us to stop allowing the world around us to sharpen the tools and the weapons of our children. Because I promise you, when we allow TikTok and social media and, and, and social, uh, social media uh, platforms and a lot of the junk they're trying to teach our kids in our schools right now, our critical race theories and 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 uh, uh, these lives matter and those lives matter, but nobody else's lives matter. We start te teaching that, ra that, that racial divides is just what, what the way life is. You know, we, you know, when we learn how to be racist, we learn how to be racist because we're taught to be racist. You take two little kids that are playing in a nursery and they're two or three years old 
you know, white kid sees a little black kid, and then they see a little Asian kid, and you got a little Indian kid sitting there, and you got a little Oriental kid sitting there. They come together. They ain't sitting there looking at each other's skin, trying to figure out what the other one is. They're sitting there just loving on each other. We teach them to that. We have a responsibility to be the forgers. We have a responsibility to be the blackness. Because if we allow that, we allow this government and we allow the world around us and we allow the social medias that are around us and all the devils that are running around in that. And we know there's some devils running around in that. And we let them begin to teach our kids and we let them be the forgers and we let them be the blacksmiths. I'm going to tell you right now, the cost is more than we can afford to pay. You're hearing a real message this morning. When the church, godly men, godly women began to be spiritual blacksmiths and forgers, this passage comes to life that says, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. Worse when the weapons are being sharpened by the spiritual blacksmiths and the spiritual forgers of those who have yielded themselves to the cross and to the, and to the, the cause of our Lord Jesus Christ. Only then does no weapon formed against you shall prosper come to play. We have plenty of spectators. We have plenty of sideline quarterbacks. That's why people like to go to big churches. Because they can slip in and slip out. Unnoticed. Put in their little religious requirement for the week. Somebody say amen. Claim my conscience, pastor, just for a little bit. So I feel a little better about my sin as I go through the week. Slip in and out. We got plenty of spectators. That's why, I, that's why I like congregations, you know, that are, that are this size, 100, 200, or smaller. Everybody knows everybody. You know why? Because you can't slip in and out. If you're coming to our church, you just want to slip in and slip out real quick. Everybody knows. Come on. In our church, you can't even go to the bathroom without everybody knowing it. Yeah, if you're playing games on your phone, everybody knows it. <laughs> we have plenty of spectators and plenty of sideline quarterbacks in the church today. We need what? Spiritual blacksmiths and spiritual forgers to sharpen the new generation of spiritual weapons that can win this war that's going on around us right now. That's what we need. In this church, in many churches like this church, we have a mission and a responsibility to this next generation. But every mission and every vision requires maintenance. The vision sets you upon a mission. This is a good quote here if you want to write this. is an Alan Baggett quote. It's a good one. The vision sets you on a mission. But the mission has to have maintenance. You can't have a mission without a vision. But the vision begins the mission. But the mission cannot be accomplished unless it's maintained. Simply put, a vision is just a dream unless you follow it through with the mission. And the mission is nothing but a dream unless you maintain that mission. That's why we need spiritual blacksmiths. That's why we need spiritual forgers. Because I don't believe that our kids have to live through the same hell that we had to live through. I don't believe they had to go through hell just so they can have a testimony. I thank God for you guys that are sitting here right now. They were wild childs growing up. 
And you found your way to the cross and God saved you and made you a brand new creation and you stand here today and you're a brand new creation. I thank God for you. I thank God you're walking in the right path today. But I pray our kids come to know Christ at a young age and serve God all their lives and all the days of their life that they don't have to walk through the same hell that we had to walk through. That they can know Jesus all the days of their life. What do you say? Listen to me. We need to keep going for this next generation and realize it is actually not a next generation but it is a now generation. They are here now. God has called them now. God wants to move on them now on our kids and upon our youth. God wants to move on them. I'm waiting for the day that our kids get up and they begin to preach and they begin to prophesy and our teenagers get filled with the Holy Spirit and they begin to weep before God and take the microphone away from Pastor Allen and begin to preach a word that God put on their heart and the Spirit pour out because the Word of God tells us Acts chapter 2 verse 17 and 18 in the last day God says I will pour out my Spirit on everyone your sons and your daughters will speak what God has revealed and your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. That's me. Hallelujah. And in those days, I will pour out my spirit on the servants of both men and women and they will speak what God has revealed. What are you saying, Pastor Allen? I'm saying it's not a next generation. It's a now generation. It's not a tomorrow generation. It's a now generation. <laughs> next step of growth. In this house, it's not going to be just rearranging the kingdom. Moving a few members from one church to the next. I appreciate those who come here. Hallelujah. Keep on coming. If you're not being fed. You're not getting what you need when you're at. Come to somewhere you get. I, I'm okay with that. But I want you to listen to me. We're not going to advance the kingdom by rearranging the kingdom. The next step of growth is in our teenagers. The next step of growth is in our kids' ministries. I know you'd like that. But with that, there's a great responsibility that lays on the shoulders of Joey as he leads the children. He's a blacksmith. He's a forger. A great responsibility lays upon Danae and Jason and Chaston and Joanna as they lead you. Because they're blacksmiths and they're forgers. Great responsibility lays upon Brandon and Elena as they lead their respective ministries because they are blacksmiths and forgers. But this isn't an Allen Baggett church. This is not a Baggett church. This is the house of God. And the only blacksmiths and forgers should not be the people that are in my family. I need people outside of my family that are blacksmiths and forgers that are willing to pay the cost to be a blacksmith and to be a forger. Somebody say, Amen. But the last thing I want to say, third point, if you do points, Samuel said the reason he was late because he was ministering to the Lord. Before he went to the battle, he had to hear from God. That's what Saul did not do. That's what Saul did not do. And Samuel says, I was late because I was ministering to the Lord. So my last point that I got out of this passage was this. Before you can lead the worship, before you can lead men, men's ministry or women's ministry, before you can lead kids' ministry, before you, can, before you can lead youth ministry, 
before you can drive a bus, before you can teach a class, before you can volunteer to be in the nursery, which is a ministry, by the way, before you can help in, the, in, in kids' ministry or Wednesday night classes. You realize we have all the curriculum and everything we need to do, everything we need for the kids. I just don't have nobody to do it. I don't have any blacksmith. I don't have any forger. Because it's just easier to stay home on Wednesday night. Where'd my amens go? I've lost every one of them. But listen, it's before you can do any of that. You must minister to the Lord. You've got to have a connection with God. Can I tell you that God is up to something good in this generation? And I'm closing, so y'all hang with me. I don't know how long I've gone. I've been trying to go shorter, but I see by looking at the faces of those who, who gave me that I have messed that up. But I'm almost finished. I'm almost finished. You're going, to be, you're, going, you're going to be home before noon. You, actually, you might beat the Baptist to the chicken. God, I said that for you. Amen. God is something, up to something good in this generation. We need to quit looking at this generation and say, what a bad generation. We need to understand that there is something good in this generation. Don't listen to the lies that this world and our, this generation is going to hell in a handbasket and there is no hope for tomorrow. I rebuke that in the name of Jesus. I rebuke that narrative. I rebuke that in the name of Jesus because it is not true. God is just looking for somebody that will be a, a blacksmith. God is just looking for somebody to be a forger to go into this, this generation that's sitting upon us right now and begin to build and begin to sharpen and begin to and show how to use the weapons of warfare. How can you say that, Pastor? Because the Bible tells me that God is not looking for a weak and a pathetic church and that he coming, when He comes again, and as He comes again, He's looking for a church that's alive and a church that is well, a church that is looking for the bridegroom to come. My friend, we as a church, we need to rise and shine and give God the glory and change the narrative of the world that's around us and let our generations know there is hope for tomorrow. As long as God is on the throne in heaven, there is hope. You know the devil's already lost the war. He already warred against Christ in heaven and lost. So the devil's trying hard to work on defeat those who, that are trying to come up and be raised up in God. So we need to tell these guys. We need to speak into the life of the leadership. We need to speak into the life of those around us. There is hope for tomorrow. And you need to listen to the right narrative. A lot of talk about narrative today. I'm going to change the narrative. I'm going to change the narrative. I'm going to change the narrative. Okay, I'm going to change the narrative. I'm going to quit talking about, quit talking about defeat. Quit talking about uh, depression. Quit talking about all those things. And begin to speak life. Change the narrative. You see, because somebody today, you're listening to me, whether online or right here right now, and there's people listening to me right now, in this room, right now, that you're in a war. But you seem to not have the right weapon for some reason to win the war. It's not because you don't have the resources. It's because your ability to use the resources has been removed. Your joy, your peace. Come on, somebody say amen. This word is for you, especially, especially if you're at that point right now today. What am I going to do now? That phrase right there is what started this whole message. 
I got a phone call, and the first thing out of their mouth is, what am I going to do now? What am I going to do now? And it's crazy because I said, maybe you should call your pastor. And, and they said, my pastor won't return my phone call. Just telling you. Maybe, maybe, maybe some of these preachers will be listening. When your phone rings, you need to answer it. What, and her, for the first statement was, what am I going to do now? And then all this began to build up inside of me. Can I tell you, if you're at that point right now, that you believe the lie. Because the lie says there's no hope. If you're at that point of what am I going to do now, then you have been allowing the enemy to sharpen your weapons instead of allowing spiritual blacksmiths and spiritual forgers to sharpen your weapons. Some of you sitting right here right now, some of you listening right now, and you're at that point of what am I going to do now? And I'm telling you this morning that God is calling you. He's calling you this morning. He's screaming to the top of his lungs if God screams. There is hope. There is hope. Ramon, if you'll come in this place, something softly for me. There is hope. Don't turn me off yet. Keep me on. You're listening to me this morning, and there's hope. You're at that, I don't know what I'm going to do. This. I don't know what I'm going to do now. You're at the point that enemies are all around you. You're looking around, and you're in a war, and you realize you don't have the right weapons to fight the war. Take the keyboard down a little bit. I don't want to overpower. The online, because I need the online people need to hear things. you realize you're being overwhelmed and, and you said I need the weapons I need the right weapons and you're, and, 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 and you're overwhelmed nobody knows about it you keep it well hidden you keep it under wraps but on the inside you're dying on the side everything's falling apart side you're saying I don't know what I'm going to do now there's no hope I've been fighting this battle too long and your peace is gone your joy is gone your faith is gone your expectation is gone God sent this preacher to tell you this morning that he's still there and all the resources that he's provided for you is still there it's just the enemy has taken the tools that you need to use those resources. God wants me to tell you this morning that He can come in even today. And He can begin to replace that peace. And he can begin to replace that joy. And he can begin to replace that faith. And strength can rise up in you. Pastor Allen, does that mean I won't have to fight the war? No, that means that you're going to have the weapons to fight the war now. I can't preach the second part of this message. Because the second part of this message, Jonathan says, enough is enough. Jonathan Coco's takes the only sword in the kingdom. And he faces off the enemy. One man against tens of thousands. God moves on his behalf. The cool thing about that story is this. That most commentators believe, most historians believe, that the Philistines captured the forgers and the blacksmiths. And as was the as was the 
the way things were done that day is they had mass their group in the center of that group of people they had big cages prison mobile prison and then they imprisoned the blacksmiths and imprisoned the forger in the middle of the camp and many believe this and I believe it I believe it my spirit that when Joshua went up on top of that hill and the, he stood his ground the Bible says the earth began to shake and the Philistines turned their weapons upon themselves began to destroy themselves in some rendition it doesn't just speak they turned upon themselves but it says that that all I'm not sure how to say it the right way because I don't want to get it wrong but this is the right thought pattern that all cages or encampments were released so when he stood his ground not only did they win the battle, but God released the master, released the blacksmiths, and he released the forgers. And David was standing here, God's coming in here, and God already had an army sitting right smack dab in the middle. And when their cages were open and released, they were able to take their weapon and begin to fight with God from the front and from within, all at the same time. And Jonathan stood his ground you're sitting on a place right now and you're saying I don't know what to do God sent me here today to tell you there's hope there's hope and the joy and the peace and the faith and the expectation that's been removed from your life because you're not to be able to use your, to use your resources God can replace. And when you fight that war, it's not going to be like it was before. You're going to win.